I don't know if I have the power to convince fascists to stop being fascists, but I hope I can convince people who are not part of this fascist movement to accept that this is a fascist movement, that we should treat it as a fascist movement, and that avoiding the term fascism is unhelpful, even dangerous. Fascism is an ideology of far-right ultranationalism that evokes a mythic past to justify a hierarchy of dominant people in a nation. Said nation is reborn under this traditional hierarchy. A fascist movement seeks to establish, legitimize, and codify this hierarchy by taking control of political power in the nation, sometimes through force, sometimes through democracy, and sometimes a combination of both. For example, following World War I, Italy's conservative prime minister, Giovanni Giolitti, formed a coalition with the fascists in hopes of keeping power from the emerging socialists and transforming the fascists into something mainstream and respectable instead of a roving gang. After gaining legitimate power, the fascists marched on Rome, and Benito Mussolini was declared prime minister by the king, gaining power through illegitimate means and legitimate means. Fascism is an ideology, a movement, but not a form of government. A government can be described as fascist the same way a government can be described as, say, conservative, but conservatism is an ideology, not a form of government. A form of government is its shape. Monarchy, democracy, aristocracy, and so forth. Fascist regimes do not always share the form of government. For example, both fascist Italy and Germany were totalitarian states, but only the former was still operating loosely within a constitutional monarchy. An ideology can influence the inner workings of the government and sometimes even change the makeup of the government, but it is not a form of government all its own. A fascist group is still a fascist group even if it does not currently hold power in government or has not yet changed the structure of government, because what makes it a fascist group is its fascist ideology. The fascists in Italy, for example, were always fascists even before they took power. An individual or group can espouse an ideology regardless of the ability to personally enforce it. This man, for example, is definitely a fascist because of his ideology, and he doesn't need to be the mayor of his town in order to be a fascist. An individual or group can be conservative or liberal or right libertarian or anarchist or any other ideology regardless of that ideology's current hold on power in the government. This is no less true of fascist ideology. With these things in mind, examining fascism as if there is some tangible, well-defined threshold in which a regime achieves fascism in government would be a mistake. A conservative politician with a conservative base does not cross a conservative threshold or achieve conservatism once they are elected. They were always conservative. To sum up, and this will be important later, if we accept that fascism is an ideology, then fascists are still fascists regardless of their current grip on power. Fascist movements use different mythic pasts, different scapegoats, but they share other traits. These include traditionalism, the rejection of modernity, hierarchical gender roles, hierarchical in-group and out-group roles, and an obsession with an invented plot against the in-group by the out-group. Italian philosopher Umberto Eco, citing Ludwig Wittgenstein, explained it this way. The notion of fascism is not unlike Wittgenstein's notion of a game. A game can be either competitive or not, it can require some special skill or none, it can or cannot involve money. Games are different activities that display only some family resemblance, as Wittgenstein put it. Consider the following sequence. 1, 2, 3, 4. A, B, C, B, C, D, C, D, E, D, E, F. Suppose there is a series of political groups in which Group 1 is characterized by the features ABC, Group 2 by the features BCD, and so on. Group 2 is similar to Group 1 since they have two features in common, for the same reasons 3 is similar to 2 and 4 is similar to 3. Fascism became an all-purpose term because one can eliminate from a fascist regime one or more features and it will still be recognizable as fascist. Take away imperialism from fascism and you still have Franco and Salazar. Take away colonialism and you still have the Balkan fascism of the Eustatius. There were, and are, a great many fascist movements, some which held power and some which did not, and framing fascism as merely the one or two most well-known examples would be ahistorical and a mistake. Now, with all of that understood, the fact that fascism is ultranationalism based on the glorification of the past, the fact that fascism is an ideology, not a form of government, 
the fact that fascism is obsessed with traditionalism, hierarchical gender roles, hierarchical in-group and out-group roles, and the fact that one can eliminate from a fascism one or more features and it will still be recognizably fascist, is MAGA a fascist movement? Well, what is MAGA? MAGA is both a slogan, Make America Great Again, and an ideological movement. Some prefer Trumpism as the ideology and MAGA as the movement, and some use the terms interchangeably. For the sake of simplicity, MAGA alone will suffice. Although MAGA has no membership and is more movement than group, its unassailable figurehead is President Donald Trump, who appropriated the phrase from past politicians into something else. Right-wing nationalism, preoccupation with a plot, preoccupation with a mythic past, and the formalization of in-groups and out-groups. MAGA as a movement either encompasses or touches upon other related groups and beliefs. QAnon is both a conspiracy theory about a deep state effort against Donald Trump and an informal group all its own. The Proud Boys are a men-only, violent, far-right gang. Explicitly racist, white nationalist, and white supremacist groups, the alt-right, and so forth. Hail Trump! Hail our people! Hail victory! Much like fascism itself and the game example by Wittgenstein, these groups have some differences in their makeup, ideology, and goals, but they all have enough commonalities and a family resemblance to be realistically considered to be part of the overall MAGA movement. There is also, undoubtedly, overlap. They all wholeheartedly support Trump. They all wear the hat. Sometimes literally, but always figuratively. According to Shane Burley, author of Fascism Today, these groups can be thought of as concentric circles, movements that are using the same logic as fascism without filling out its entire ideological checklist. A humiliated nation drawing on a past that does not exist and being promised a return to greatness if they follow a strongman authoritarian is the model of a fascist movement. Trump never explicitly says when the United States was great, allowing his supporters to draw on a vague past. However, references in his 2016 rallies about his fondness for police brutality against protesters suggest he is referring to a time before the end of segregation. I love the old days. You know what they used to do to guys like that when they were in a place like this? They'd be carried out on a stretcher, folks. In the good old days, law enforcement acted a lot quicker than this. A lot quicker. In the good old days, they'd rip him out of that seat so fast. The humiliation that he claims the nation has felt often came back to Barack Obama. To Trump's predominantly white supporters, the message is clear that they are the victims of the end of segregation and that they are the victims of the first African-American president. This mythic past is just that, a fabrication. Segregation was one of the many blights on the nation's history, and the president immediately before Obama was widely regarded as one of the worst of all time. The common denominator of these periods is the amount of power in the hands of white America. Now, labeling politics and political thought under Trump as well as the political movement around Trump as fascist causes consternation among political pundits and editorialists. For one, they don't want to seem alarmist. For another, some are simply ignorant about what fascism even is, mistakenly believing it only to be its most extreme incarnation or something that only existed in the first half of the 20th century. For another, some are ignorant about the fact that fascist movements form under liberal democracy. It can't happen here, is their common refrain, even though this system in this kind of nation is exactly where it commonly happens. And finally, some dismiss MAGA as a fascist movement because they support MAGA, or President Trump, or the Republican Party, and that term being seen as related to their ideology is something they would choose to avoid. Denial of MAGA and the Trump administration having anything even resembling fascist ideology is self-preservation by conservatives and, yes, outright fascists. No matter what MAGA does, no matter how many historically fascist talking points they echo, and no matter how much us-versus-them fascist rhetoric is uttered by the President of the United States, calling it fascism is still forbidden. When Trump calls for the refusal of a religious group to enter the country, that is still, somehow, not fascist rhetoric. 
when secret police usher protesters into unmarked vans that is still, somehow, not reminiscent of how fascists have historically controlled the people. Whenever something occurs that can be described as fascist, the discourse goes thusly. If fascist tactics are successful, MAGA and its defenders claim that such tactics cannot possibly be fascist if they can coexist within liberal democracy, which again is ahistorical about democracy's role in creating fascism. If fascist tactics are unsuccessful, MAGA claims that liberal democracy has safeguarded us against fascist tactics and therefore said tactics are not worth worrying about, because it's only fascism if it's successful, mistakenly defining fascism by the aforementioned threshold that historically does not exist. The most notable example of this circular argument is President Trump attempting to cancel the election. He has explicitly recommended that the election should not take place this year. Undermining elections and consolidating power are both part of the fascist playbook. Defenders of Trump say that since he is probably unable to do this due to the Constitution, any suggestion that this is fascist is alarmist. Conversely, if Trump actually does successfully weaponize the Department of Justice and other departments to cancel the election, those same people will say that he has done so legitimately using the powers of his office and is therefore not fascist. It's a doublespeak that allows any action to be defended as normal, no matter how egregious and no matter its level of success. The existence of structural safeguards to prevent some of the more egregious acts of authoritarianism and common fascist tactics does not change the fact that such tactics are being attempted. Prevention in the midst of an action does not terminate the existence of the action in the first place. The Allies winning World War II does not somehow mean that World War II did not happen. In short, using the term fascism might seem hyperbolic, but at some point it becomes more absurd to not call it fascism. Too much has happened both inside and outside the White House. Bear in mind that none of this means that everyone who has worn a MAGA hat is a member of a white supremacist organization, or that everyone who marches reads a lot of fascist theory, or that Trump is a day away from extermination camps, or anything along those lines. It's not some fascist conspiracy, nor is it even an elaborate, remarkable plan. It's simply the common result of blunt, uneducated prejudices and values amplified by a strongman who wants to take advantage of the people. The assertion made here is only that the overall ideology of the MAGA movement and all that touches on that movement can credibly be called fascist that this label has become more and more credible as the years have gone on, and that the figurehead of said movement employs fascist politics, fascist rhetoric, and at times, violent fascist tactics. Fascism requires the majority to believe themselves the true victims, the true oppressed people, being forced to share power with minorities, to the majority, egalitarianism can feel like oppression. This false victimization is accomplished by creating the perception of an in-group and an out-group. America was built by and for the white Christian people of this nation. Us versus them, emphasizing that the in-group has a right to this country, that the in-group is the creator, the giver, while the out-group has less right or no right to this country and that they are the takers, the parasites who feed off the creators, the givers. In his very first speech as a presidential candidate, Trump infamously warned his predominantly white supporters of the dangers of Mexicans crossing the border to sexually violate the women of the United States. Apologists for Trump hand wave this away and say he was simply being tough on crime or some other excuse, ignoring the fact that this is a historically fascist tactic. According to How Fascism Works by Jason Stanley, to ensure the right kind of moral panic about these groups, its members are represented as particular kinds of threats to the fascist nation. Most important, and most typical, a threat to its purity. Consequently, fascist politics also emphasizes one kind of crime. The basic threat that fascist propaganda uses to raise fear is that members of the targeted group will rape members of the chosen nation, thereby polluting its blood. The threat of mass rape is simultaneously intended as a threat to the patriarchal norms of the fascist state, to the manhood of the nation. 
The crime of rape is basic to fascist politics because it raises sexual anxiety and an attendant need for protection of the nation's manhood by the fascist authority. The threat of a non-white, sexually insatiable minority is also something historically used to stoke fear of black Americans preying on white Americans, particularly white women. And remember my opening remarks at Trump Tower when I opened, everybody said, oh, he was so tough. And I used the word rape. Women are raped at levels that nobody's ever seen before. And it's unbelievable when you look at what's going on. So all I'm doing is telling the truth. I've read the... I read the Washington Post, I read the Fusion, I read the Huffington Post, and that, that's about women being raped. It's not about criminals coming across the border or entering the country. Well, somebody's doing the raping, Don. I mean, you know, it, it's, I mean, somebody's doing it. You think it's women being raped. Well, who's doing the raping? The superficial hierarchy might seem like American citizens over Mexican citizens, but the implied hierarchy based on the rhetoric and historical usage of this rhetoric is white Americans over non-white immigrants, and taken to its extreme, white Americans over non-white Americans. And Donald Trump's movement, whether you know Kellyanne Conway wants to admit it or not, was fundamentally about identity, and it was about identity for white people. Fascist rhetoric presents the racial majority with the idea that this land is owed to them alone, and that others exist there only at their discretion. After being elected, Trump invoked nationalism in explicit terms. You know, they have a word. It sort of became old-fashioned. It's called a nationalist. And I say, really, we're not supposed to use that word. You know what I am? I'm a nationalist, okay? And I am a nationalist. It's a word that hasn't been used too much. People use it. But I'm very proud. I think it should be brought back. When nationalism becomes the ultranationalism inherent in fascism is a matter of debate on degrees. But considering Trump proposed a nearly 2,000-mile, 50-foot wall on the border between the United States and Mexico, claimed that Mexico must pay for this wall, called countries suffering from poverty holes, blamed other countries like China for his mistakes, and a lot more, it seems credible to label it as such. Nationalism is common among American conservatives, but since nationalism has clearly been pushed even further to the right, what other term but ultranationalism should we use? During Trump's campaign, he promised to ban all Muslims from entering the United States. This was widely condemned by anyone who was not part of the MAGA movement and widely applauded by those who were. Apologists for Trump claimed that this was all bluster and that nobody would, or perhaps even could, actually do that. One week after his inauguration, Trump signed an executive order banning entry into the United States from seven Muslim-majority countries. Apologists pounced, claiming that Trump had not actually banned Muslims, but merely any foreign national from Muslim-majority countries. But his previous statement that his goal was to ban Muslims specifically strains the credulity of this defense. I think Islam hates us. This ban went back and forth in the courts until the third version of the ban was upheld in 2018 by the Supreme Court in a close 5-4 ruling. The ban, and the discourse around it, is another example of how those who wish to avoid words like fascism paint Trump's actions and his supporters' unwavering acceptance. His detractors rightly cried fascism. Then, when Trump enacted the ban, the same supporters shifted what fascism is, that even though the ban went into effect, it was still not fascism because it was enacted within the confines of liberal democracy. By this logic, nothing can ever be fascism if the current institutions endorse it and comply with it. Misidentifying fascism as simply totalitarianism has the intended effect of protecting fascism. In the summer of 2017, a collection of white supremacists and far-right groups, most of which aligned themselves with Trump, marched, rallied, shouted historically fascist slogans, carried fascist banners and flags, and engaged in violence, in one case, fatally. Following the event, widely called Unite the Right, Trump defended his supporters, called many who marched very fine people, and blamed those opposed to the fascist rally as having equal blame in the chaos. The resurgence of white supremacist groups, White supremacist rallies and the acceptability of far-right gangs are the byproducts of the mainstreaming of fascist rhetoric and fascist politics by Trump. According to the Brookings Institution, 
While some observers have explained Trump's success as a result of economic anxiety, the data demonstrates that anti-immigrant sentiment, racism, and sexism are much more strongly related to support for Trump. He did especially well with white people who express sexist views about women and who deny racism exists. Even more alarmingly, there is a clear correlation between Trump campaign events and incidents of prejudiced violence. FBI data shows that since Trump's election, there has been an anomalous spike in hate crimes concentrated in counties where Trump won by larger margins. It was the second largest uptick in hate crimes in the 25 years for which data was available, second only to the spike after September 11, 2001. Apologists for Trump and for MAGA at large, knowing that racism and fascism are bedfellows, try to distance the movement from racism by noting that there exists a handful of minorities in important positions within Trump's cabinet, and that there was still some small amount of support from racial minorities. However, this is not unusual for a fascist movement. Historically speaking, there are always sellouts, always turncoats, always people for whom their desire to be accepted by the majority outweighs everything else. The overall makeup of MAGA and their overall fascist ideology cannot be hand waved away by the mere existence of outliers. Advancing fascist policy to the people requires the speaker to selectively use terms that are mainstream with the implication of something far more extreme. When fascists want to avoid explicitly racial terms but still make a racist statement, they can use the word suburban instead of white and urban instead of whichever minority is the target. This is only one example of how manipulating language and communication allows fascists to spread extreme rhetoric while still maintaining plausible deniability. Again from Jason Stanley. When propaganda succeeds at twisting ideals against themselves and universities are undermined and condemned as sources of bias, reality itself is cast into doubt. We can't agree on truth. Fascist politics replaces reasoned debate with fear and anger. When it is successful, its audience is left with a destabilized sense of loss and a well of mistrust and anger against those who it has been told are responsible for this loss. Fascist politics exchanges reality for the pronouncements of a single individual or perhaps a political party. Regular and repeated obvious lying is part of the process by which fascist politics destroys the information space. A fascist leader can replace truth with power, ultimately lying without consequence. By replacing the world with a person, fascist politics makes us unable to assess arguments by a common standard. Trump has created a false reality, and MAGA is willing to participate in its maintenance. This false reality operates like this. Anything positive said about Trump is truth-telling, and anything negative said about Trump is fake news. Trump co-opted this pre-existing term, fake news, during the campaign. He turned it to his favor and transformed it into a response to anything damning about his rhetoric, policies, or personal history. Because of Trump's close relationship with conservative media figures, the term fake news propagated and was falsely legitimized by pundits and talking heads. Responding to criticism with the simple phrase, fake news, is a strategy of non-engagement. Rather than discuss the topic or debate the allegations, MAGA can simply dismiss serious, unambiguous misdeeds by Trump by claiming that the misdeeds simply never occurred. If a number of sources report on something Trump did, then the sources must be lying. Fake news. If Trump himself said or did something inflammatory on camera, then Trump did not mean it that way. Fake news. We might be able to see it, but the false reality washes it away. It may as well have never happened. Fascist politics cannot hold up to intellectual scrutiny because it's so rooted in so many demonstrable lies. A mythic past, a scapegoat enemy, the oppression of the majority somehow. Instead of interrogating these lies and judging their veracity, fascists create a new lie on top of the previous lies. A big lie that says that the smaller lies must be true. Trump's big lie is that anything reported in the media that reflects negatively on him is fake, which allows all of his smaller lies to be converted to truth by MAGA. Believing the big lie is very attractive to people because it means that they know the real truth and have seen the world for what it is. 
The lie is not only attractive, but necessary. They must believe the big lie. Because without the big lie on top of all the smaller lies, well, the smaller lies have no protection. MAGA as a whole would have to concede that their figurehead is actually lying most of the time and that nearly everything said about him was the truth. MAGA's opponents are dumbfounded that so many people can believe literally thousands of lies, but that is not exactly the case. They only believe one, the big lie. And because it's so attractive and makes them feel so smart, the only lie they need to believe is easily swallowed. In the book, Can It Happen Here?, Cass R. Sunstein wrote, If people stop believing in the truth of what they read, they don't have to think hard about political questions. Instead, they can simply make political decisions based on identity or affiliation with their political allies. This false reality, this non-belief in truth, has many MAGA devotees searching for their own truth. Enter QAnon, a far-right conspiracy theory that the Democrats worship the devil, that Tom Hanks is a child trafficker, and cannibal, that Hollywood actors ingest an imaginary psychedelic liquid harvested from children, that Robert Mueller was actually investigating all of this and not Trump, and that Trump has been chosen to be the man to stop it. Every mistake that Trump makes, every misdeed, is part of an elaborate plan to expel the devil. It's a series of incredible lies upon lies upon lies, but believers are only required to accept one lie. That Q is real. The big lie works here too. When Q makes the odd prediction that turns out to be partially correct, QAnon supporters cite this as evidence that everything else, no matter how absurd, is also correct. When Q frequently makes predictions that turn out to be false, then this is merely fake news that can be ignored. Criticism emboldens them because they think those criticizing Trump are part of the conspiracy. Criticism, therefore, does not become evidence against QAnon, but evidence of the deep state. Not everyone who identifies with MAGA believes in the Q conspiracy theory or has even ever heard of it, but everyone is following a similar pattern. Believing the big lie and subsequently seeing all criticism as evidence of fake news. The false reality of MAGA is so pervasive that QAnon now has high-profile supporters, and the movement has largely been endorsed, or at least praised, by Trump himself. During the pandemic, uh, the QAnon movement has been, appears to be gaining a lot of followers. Can you talk about what you think about that and what you have to say to people who are following this movement right now? Well, I don't know much about the movement other than I understand they like me very much. Uh, which I appreciate, but I don't know much about the movement. Uh, these are people that don't like seeing what's going on in places like Portland and places like Chicago and New York and other cities and states. And uh, I've heard these are people that love our country and they just don't like seeing it. When confronted with the particulars of the conspiracy theory by a journalist, the devil, Hollywood and such, he doubled down. At the crux of the theory is this belief that you are secretly saving the world from this satanic cult of pedophiles and cannibals. Does that sound like something you are behind? Or well, I haven't, I haven't heard that, but uh, is that supposed to be a bad thing or a good thing? I mean, you know, if, uh, if I can help save the world from problems, I'm willing to do it. I'm willing to put myself out there. Once again, fascism cannot hold up to scrutiny because it's built on lies, which means greater lies that obscure smaller lies and misdeeds are necessary components in its maintenance. The modern centralized police force is an instrument of control that is used as a substitute for meaningful change. Armed agents of the state to control the poor instead of support to ease criminogenic conditions. At their worst, the police force is still all of those things, plus an instrument of fascism. The police have long served to control dissent against the state. When the head of state is even worse than usual, dissent becomes greater, which requires even greater control. In the midst of protests against the police in 2020, Trump vowed to dominate the protesters. Trump filled downtown Washington, D.C. with U.S. Marshals, agents from the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the Bureau of Prisons, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms and Explosives, Homeland Security, Customs and Border Protection, Transportation Security Agency, and the Department of Defense. 
without batch numbers, without names on their uniforms, without even identification of which department they belong to or who they serve, without any means whatsoever in which to identify them. For all the inherent problems with local police, they at least display their names and badge numbers, forcing at least some small amount of accountability for officers and their precincts. In the case of this swarm of heavily armed federal agents, there is not even the appearance of accountability. In the early evening of June 1st, just outside the White House, this swarm of unidentifiable federal agents fired tear gas and rubber pellet grenades to scatter largely peaceful demonstrators. This cleared a path for Trump to walk to St. John's Church for a brief three-minute photo op. Although some details are still unknown, much of their activities are under the supervision of the Department of Homeland Security, a federal executive department. In other words, due to the enormous power of the executive branch, Trump can call upon this private army and direct it to do almost anything. Apologists for these agents are invariably also apologists for Trump. They say that it is alarmist to call them the secret police. However, considering their complete lack of identification, fealty to Trump due to being comprised of federal agents, and tactics including tossing people into unmarked vehicles, it becomes more difficult to avoid calling them the secret police. It becomes a game in which everything secretive about what they are doing must be replaced with some other more innocuous word. What else would one call an unidentifiable secretive entity that serves to control people at the behest of the head of state? Inside, President Trump was on Twitter threatening to retaliate with, in his words, vicious dogs and ominous weapons. And in a tweet that critics said evoked images of civil rights era police sicking dogs on protesters, the president said nobody came close to breaching the fence. If they had, they would have been greeted with the most vicious dogs and most ominous weapons I have ever seen. The fact that this incredible overreach of executive power is happening to quell Black Lives Matter protesters and allied anti-racist groups should not go unnoticed. A fascist conception of law and order divides people into an in-group and an out-group. The out-group invariably contains the racial minority. The out-group is not only labeled a threat to law and order, but a threat to the nation itself, presenting the in-group with an existential threat to themselves and to their cherished homeland. To the in-group, any means used to stop the threat, no matter how egregious, can appear necessary. In spite of everything, there has been no real pushback from MAGA. No pushback from supporters in the media, supporters in the streets, supporters on social media, and worst of all, supporters within these institutions. George Packer of The Atlantic wrote, when Donald Trump came into office, there was a sense that he would be outmatched by the vast government he had just inherited. The new president was impetuous, bottomlessly ignorant, almost chemically inattentive, while the bureaucrats were seasoned, shrewd, protective of themselves and their institutions. They knew where the levers of power lay and how to use them or prevent the president from doing so. Trump's White House was chaotic and vicious, unlike anything in American history, but it didn't really matter as long as the adults were there to wait out the president's impulses and deflect his worst ideas and discreetly pocket destructive orders lying around on his desk. After three years, the adults have all left the room, saying just about nothing on their way out to alert the country to the peril, while Trump is still there. In addition to Trump's supporters and his apologists within the far reaches of the MAGA cult, there are also above-it-all centrists and satisfied liberals who also dismiss these warnings as alarmist and say in unison, it can't happen here, even as it's happening. They have so much misplaced faith in the institutions within liberal democracy, even as these institutions are proven time and time again to be easily corruptible. Democracy alone can't save us because our democracy chose this. Liberals say not to worry because the Constitution will protect us, but it has not so far. By some estimates, Trump has violated the Constitution dozens of times, and nothing has been done except an impotent impeachment. 
Democracy itself opens the door for fascist ideology, not only through corruption, but because anything can happen here if roughly half the nation wants it to. There is no pushback against Trump among his own people, which means there is no bottom, no limit to what can be done, and no end to his supporters moving the goalposts to cloud the discourse. Apologists will always find some other outline, some loophole for why this must not be publicly declared a fascist movement, always purposefully missing the definition of fascist ideology, always not seeing that it need not be identical to the common perception of fascism in the popular consciousness. MAGA might never self-reflect, and certainly never declare its ideology as fascist. They might not even know why this rhetoric appeals to them, only that it does. As I said in the beginning, I don't intend to convince them to give up their strongman. Instead, I wish to convince those of us outside their group to stop playing their rhetorical game, accept that their ideology is that of fascism whether they realize it or not, and act accordingly. If we have ever wondered how we would have acted when threatened with an early 20th century fascist movement, the answer is however we are acting right now. People are worried that calling this what it is won't be helpful in the discourse, but downplaying what has been happening has not been helpful so far. It has even helped this movement propagate itself. People are so afraid to call this what it is for fear of being ostracized as an alarmist, but those days need to be over. It has been four years. Every prediction for what a Trump presidency backed by the MAGA movement would look like either came true or ended up being even worse than predicted. The alarmists were right. Any argument that amounts to, well, this specific thing hasn't happened yet, is irrelevant. Sell that to someone who has not been paying attention. It is my hope, my sincere hope, that this is the last research essay I will ever have to write about Donald Trump or the Make America Great Again movement. But that's not up to me. It's up to us. Does all of this end soon? Swept away by resistance and conflict like so many other fascist movements? Or will fascist ideology become the new normal? I think it's a good idea with everything that's going on in the world right now. I mean, it, it sounds harsh, but reality is reality. I think that that is a very wise decision made very prudently after due diligence, and I am very impressed with the fact that he's bold enough to come out and do that. I'd have to think about it a while. Okay. I'd have to absolutely think about that.